believe that something started to break in this place? Listen. Do it again. Do it like. Do it like. Do it like this. Every time, stop. Music, go with me. Do it like. Do it like. Some of you need to give God glory. Do it like. One more time. Come on. One of the hardest things to do in life is to wait. Maybe you know it this weekend if you've been waiting for your electricity, your power to come back on, or, or maybe just even waiting in line at the bank if you're like me, or waiting in traffic, or waiting uh, for a plane, or waiting for a bus, or waiting for dinner to be cooked, or whatever you're waiting. Waiting can be very frustrating, but when it comes to waiting on a promise from God, it can be doubly frustrating. But you'll notice that in situations, God will oftentimes have us waiting. And, you know, and, and the real frustrating thing about that is that if you're waiting on a healing, perhaps, or if you're waiting, believing God to be, to, to have a child, and uh, you see people who aren't believers all around you experiencing some of the things that you're believing God for, and you're the righteousness of God, and, and, and like David, even David said, Lord, have you forgotten your mercies? Have you forgotten me? My bed is being filled with tears. And you can hear David's heart and, and he's a man after God's own heart and he knows that, that uh, he has a covenant with God, but yet he's, he's waiting on some of these promises to come to pass and they don't seem to be coming to pass on a, on a timely basis and he's concerned. And we see this all throughout the scriptures and today uh, you may be in that same situation. And today I wanna help answer this problem for you because there's a, there's a great revelation that's given throughout the scriptures and uh, I wanna begin to share some of that with you today. Are y'all ready for it? Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. And uh, here we find the story of Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. And the Bible talks, uh, shares about how much that Jesus loved them and how much they loved him. And uh, y'all know the story. A tragedy occurred in this family that the Bible lets us know are great friends of Jesus. And, uh, and so we can't really be shocked and surprised with some tragedy that goes on in our lives, some, some devastation, some surprise. And they were shocked by this. And so let's just, let's just jump right into the story. John chapter 11 and verse 3. Praise the Lord. Are y'all there yet? John, yes, 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 yes. Look at this. Uh, this tragedy strikes the family, and, and look what it says. Therefore, the sisters, Martha and Mary, sent to Jesus, saying, they didn't go out to him, they sent word to him. He was about two miles away, by the way. And uh, they said, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. He whom you love is sick. This lets us know some revelation here. They knew they were loved by Jesus. And this really is the key here to you getting a miracle. Knowing that you're loved by Jesus. Say that, I'm loved by Jesus. And, and so we see this from the scriptures that they recognize that. And, they, and I loved how they communicated word to Jesus that there was a problem. They didn't just say, hey, Lazarus is, is uh, sick. They said, no, no, he whom you love is sick. And so they're reminding Jesus uh, of what they know, that you love him. That you love us. And this is a great revelation for us to hold on to as well when we go before the Lord. you got to know that you're the beloved of God. We talk about that all the time. But uh, let, hit the next verse for me, please. When Jesus heard that, heard what? Reminded that he loved this man who's now sick. When Jesus heard that, he said something. Here's more revelation. Again, I don't have time to go into great detail about this, but Jesus said something based on a situation that he heard. We too should say something as soon as we hear bad news. 
Jesus said something, but look what he said. He said, this sickness is not unto death. This lack, this devastation is not unto death. This situation is not going to take me out. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about? When you face a tragedy, when you face a situation, open up your mouth immediately when you hear it. Because our tendency is to open up our mouth and rehearse the tragedy, rehearse the devastation, but that's not necessary. What is necessary is that you rehearse the promise of God. This sickness is not unto death. This lack and whatever you're facing right now, you need to rehearse that. Say it out of your mouth. The Bible lets us know, and we talked about this on Wednesday as well, that righteousness speaks. And there is a promise in the word for every situation that you're facing based on your righteousness. And that righteousness is based on God's love for you. It all ties together. But when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. In other words, the outcome of this situation is going to be for God's glory. Whatever you're facing right now, know this too, that the outcome of your situation is going to be for the glory of God. Hitting and encourage that person next to you say, oh yeah, it's going to work out for your good and God's glory. <laughs> Watch this, that the son of God may be glorified through it. All kinds of revelation there. Hit the next one. Watch this. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So here we have this reiterated again. John, the narrator, John, the beloved states this. He says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. So confirming exactly what they were saying. Watch this. Next verse. So circle. So right there. Now notice what the state, the the word says. Now Martha, now Jesus loved Martha, Lazarus and Mary. He loved them. So in other words, because he loved them, When he heard that he was sick, he stayed two days more in the place where he was. So because he loved them, he delayed. When he heard he was so because of that previous verse, because he loved them. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two days more in the place where he was. Because he loves, he delays. And think about it just logically for a second. The Bible lets us know and through all the prophecies throughout the scripture that Jesus, after the children of Israel, became a nation again. Came a nation again and the children of Israel came back into Israel in 1948. From that point forward, Jesus could return. That's the last prophecy to be fulfilled. However, he's delaying. Why? We already know it. It's in Peter. Because his desire is that none should perish. So we can even see in that delay that there's something that God wants to accomplish for humanity's good in his delay. Do y'all see that? But what, what is staggering is in a, in a negative situation that appears very negative, right? Death. I mean, Lazarus dies in this scenario. Come on, this, it, it doesn't get any worse than this. And maybe you face some situations like this. And so let me, let me teach this. Is this helping anybody already? <laughs> All right. All right. So he stayed where he was two days more. All right. Uh, now, what was it that he wanted them to know? And it's all revealed here in this passage. It's all revealed in this whole chapter. And again, Wednesdays is a day that I can break down some of the details of this. But if you'll jump forward to John chapter 11, verse 25 and 26 in the Amplified Bible, when Jesus delays, when he delays, it's for a revelation to come to you that no one else has. God wants a revelation for you to have a revelation during the wait that no one else on earth has. And they get a revelation here. We're going to see it in this family. They get a revelation that no one, not even the disciples, no one else had. And I want to show it to you. Are y'all with me? Remember what happened? Martha came running out and she came fussing at Jesus because he came and Lazarus was already buried and, and you know, he was dead and buried. And then now Jesus is going to show up. Jesus is going to show up and uh, Martha runs out and she's very upset. And, uh, and she says, if you hadn't, if you had been here, my, my, my brother wouldn't died. And if you read through the whole account, you got to read through the whole chapter. And, and Jesus makes some statements to the disciples before he leaves. He says, it's good that I not be there. It's good that I'm not there right now. And so all these things come into play. He, he, he said, it's good that I'm not there so that you guys will believe. So he wants them to get this revelation that they believe in him, that they see his glory. All right. Now watch this. Jesus said to her, I am my, she said, no, Jesus said this to Martha. He said, uh, uh, 
You're, he said, if you hadn't been here, my brother wouldn't have died. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. She said, I know he's, I'll see him again in the resurrection. I don't care about that. I'm concerned about right now. And in death situations, that's all of our cry. Lord, we know we're going to see him again. That's not the problem. I want to see him right now. I don't want him gone now. I don't want her gone now. Come on, somebody say amen right there. I'm telling you the truth. But see, Jesus' perspective on death is completely different. The death situation didn't bother him. Why? And this is a mystery for us to understand. Well, as long as we're still in the flesh, this will always be difficult for us to have this God perspective. Because we're, we're here in the body, and for us to look out in eternity is very difficult. But Jesus, who came from eternity and stepped into time, it's very easy for him to have this perspective. And so he minimizes this death situation and, and looks at, talks about resurrection. Why? Because think about it. And, and Wednesday, I gave this illustration. If eternity from, were from that wall over there to that wall over there, which y'all can't see beyond these curtains, right? If eternity for, were from all over there and time, time would be essentially in terms of eternity, not even one of these threads of one carpet, not even one thread. Time is that, is that short. Time is that short. And so to Jesus, he's, you know, he's saying uh, this isn't, this isn't a, a, a really huge matter. To us, because we don't see from that perspective. We don't live from that perspective. We live from the carpet's perspective. Are y'all following what I'm saying? We, we see through natural eyes at, at a situation. So we don't really have a grasp. It's impossible for us in this body to get a grasp of true eternity. Are y'all with me? And I'll help you understand in a second. But let's look at, look at what Jesus wanted him to get. I'll come back to that because I do have that in my notes too. Now watch this. Uh, what is the revelation? Jesus, here's what he tells her. Jesus said to her, I am myself the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in, adheres to, trusts in and relies on me, although he may die, yet he shall live. In other words, this death that you're talking about here, he isn't really dead. He's still really living. Are you with me? And what he says first is, I am the resurrection and the life. What Jesus is saying is you experience resurrection first, you actually never die. See, we think we, Martha and Mary, they, they thought, well, hold on. You live first and then resurrection comes. Jesus says, no, no, no. You get resurrection with me first, then life. And so although he died, he shall still be alive, right? Whoever continues to live and believes in, has faith in, cleaves to and relies on me, shall never actually die at all. But my brother's dead is what they're saying. But but if you believe in me, you'll actually never die at all anyway. So do you see what he's saying? He's trying to show her that, no, no, this, because of the resurrection, because of me, there is no death for you who believe in me. Are you with me? Now, I'm going to jump real quick to the, to the, uh, to the cross because this is where, the, where you see that they have a revelation that no one else has. Jump on over, if you would, to Luke chapter 24, verse 9 through 12. Luke 24, 9 through 12. Amen? This is Jesus goes to the cross, right? And if you're at the cross, everybody's there. You see an account. If you read through all the Gospels, you'll see... Uh, that everybody was there. All, his, all, all the Marys, Mary Magdalene, his mother, everybody's there at the cross. And those who didn't understand the resurrection were at his tomb. Watch this. Watch what happens here. Then they return. I'm in verse 9. Then they return from the tomb and told what happened. Mary, uh, Mary Magdalene was the first one to see Jesus, uh, that, that the tomb was empty. The Bible says that she went there very early in the morning while it was still dark. And she got to the tomb and noticed that the stone was rolled away. Mary Magdalene, all right? She gets to the tomb and she notices that the stone is rolled away and that there's no, nobody's in the tomb. She's... Uh, she's frantic about this, runs all the way back and tells the disciples, the 11 that are left, watch this. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things. Mary, the mother of James, it lists exactly who was there at that tomb. Martha, Mary, and Lazarus were not listed. They weren't waiting there. They weren't, exp- they weren't at that tomb. Now watch this. It says they uh, told the 11 and to all the rest. They told the 11 and all the other people that were believing. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women. If you read through all the four gospels, you'll see everybody who was there. And told these things to the apostles. 
They ran to the apostles and their words seemed to them like idle tales and they did not believe them. Even the apostles didn't believe. They didn't understand why he wasn't in that tomb. If you read the accounts, Mary Magdalene says, I, I, where are you? Where, I wanted to take, well, she runs into Jesus in the garden, but doesn't recognize him. She says, someone's taken my Lord. Someone's taken him. And she says, if he were here, I would have just taken him for myself. They didn't believe in the resurrection. Everybody except Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. They believed it. They didn't even show up there. And they were the best friends of Jesus. They knew him more than everybody else. And while everyone loved him and were concerned about him, they were the only ones who had a revelation that he's not going to be there. They stayed home. Now, while everyone else was crying and frantic, they're sitting at home probably eating chicken wings. Now, get my point here. Get my point. God, Jesus wanted them to get this revelation that resurrection comes by believing in me. I'm going to get up. You don't have to worry about it. I'm getting up out of that grave. Mary sat at his feet and got a revelation of this. No one else did, not even the disciples. Now, my whole point in that is, during the wait, God wants you to get a revelation that no one else has. That will doubly bless you. Let me show you it in some more stories. Are y'all with me already? Come on, somebody, hit the person next to you. God wants to give me revelation in the wait. Now, let's talk about death just for a second. Uh, for, for Jesus in this whole death situation with Lazarus, it wasn't a problem. Let me just say this, though. Once they got the revelation of who he was, Jesus was able to resurrect him from the dead. It changed their whole family once they understood that once they knew Jesus, death came. Death couldn't touch them. All right. Now, jump on over. Let me just show you these passages. I don't know if y'all have these back there. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8, Paul says this, that, uh, that um, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Y'all heard that passage before? 2 Corinthians 5, 8, to be absent from the body. Just jot it down. I don't know if they have those back there. But Jesus gives us insight into what believers, now, I'm saying this to, for those of you who may have lost a loved one and that pain that you're experiencing is very is very painful here in life because that's part of it that's it, it, when you lose anything here in life it's painful lose a job you're going to cry over that lose a loved one you're going to really cry over that and that's part of it god doesn't mind that but i just want you to know you're not crying over that loved one you're crying over you missing that loved one but if you'll get this eternal perspective, you'll change your thinking here just a bit. And that's what I want to help you do. Watch this. He said, and Paul says that we are confident. Yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present. We're well pleased to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. He said it's pleasing to do that, right? Paul talk, has a dissertation in Philippians where he talks about, I'm not sure, I'm kind of between the two. Rather to stay here is for your benefit or to go, it's for my benefit. Are you with me? If I stay with you, it's going to be for me to benefit you. But if I go, it's for my benefit. Yeah. But because I love y'all so much, I'm going to hang around a little bit longer. Yeah. Had he seen heaven, tasted heaven, he wouldn't have come back. Yeah. He wouldn't want to. The perspective of heaven changes the whole perspective of, of, of temporary life here. Yeah. Changes the whole perspective. Now, let me show you that. Watch in, in, uh, in John chapter 17 and verse 24, Jesus in his... Uh, his high priestly prayer before he goes to heaven makes a statement here about what we're doing in heaven and what believers are doing in heaven uh, while we're here on earth, all right? In John 17, uh, verse 24, we see it. There it is. It says, he prays this prayer. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you love me from the foundation of the world. So we, we get a peep here at what believers are doing in heaven. Now, I've always had this impression of heaven about streets of gold and crystal river and all this fruit on the tree of life and all this sort of stuff and, and, the, and seeing my relatives there. But, the, but I never really had a good perspective of seeing Jesus there. But you can get that perspective if you look at Revelation chapter 5. And it talks about how there's a throne in the center and then 24 thrones, elders around it. And that's talking about the whole body of Christ of believers. And, and uh, so Jesus is in the center of that. So around this throne is 24 other thrones, but Jesus is in the center of it and we're beholding his glory. Amen. And it, you can read all that in Revelation. But once you get a peek of the true Jesus, 
see his glory, you'll never again, it, you won't cry over anything here on earth because it changes your whole perspective of, of, of life here on earth. Eternity will change your whole perspective. Here, Paul writes about it right here in this passage. Look again, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. Take a look at this. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Look at this next one. For our light affliction, which is but a, for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Paul calls everything that goes on here in earth light affliction. And it's going to lead to a more a weight of eternal glory. In other words, this glory that we'll see in Jesus will overshadow anything that you experience here. Are you with me? So while we're crying over things that are lost, over death, there also is a promise of sevenfold restoration. Yeah. There's, I mean, a loss of a job, even a loss of a loved one, the Bible shows us. If you lose a child, that God will restore seven times. You say, but I love that child. I love, Yeah, yeah. But I'm telling you, you'll see them again in heaven. You'll see them again. Just like any love, lo, love lost one here in earth, if you've ever sent kids away to college, I mean, you may cry over them, but you know you're going to see them again. Yeah. That's what God's perspective is. It's like, and that's what with Lazarus, if you don't even, if you don't see him here, this is going to be such a short time. You're going to see him and enjoy glory with Jesus and them forever. Eternity, it's, with, it's beyond what you can even imagine right now. And I know that doesn't take away the present pain, but I want you to know that our light affliction, which is but for a moment, that's from an eternal perspective. Hit the person next to you and say, there's nothing here in earth that will overshadow the eternal glory of Jesus. Come on, I know this isn't a shouting message, but I want you to think about it so it will help you in the future. Are y'all with me? Now, let's look at the story of Abraham because here's, a, here's an awesome story about waiting. Are y'all with me? In Acts, ooh, there's, see again, this is a Wednesday kind of after, Wednesday Bible study lesson because there's some secrets that are told about most of this, many of the patriarchs in the Bible in the book of Acts. One of them's right here by, told by Stephen right as he's about to be stoned. He's about to be stoned by Paul, the apostle, I might add. Amen. It's all written in this whole account. But watch what he says about Abraham right here. He says, and he said, brethren and, uh, uh, brethren and fathers, listen, the God of glory. Circle that in your Bible if you've got that. The God of glory. Here again is this mention of glory. <laughs> appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. Before he got to Haran, well, think about that for a minute. If you read, we think, we typically pick up the story of Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis, but it actually starts in chapter 11. But he's not mentioned, his father is mentioned. His father's name is Terah. His father's name is Terah, but the Bible lets us know here that God actually spoke to Abraham, appeared to him in glory before chapter 12. And he said to him, get out of your country from your relatives and come to the land. All that's in Genesis chapter 12, but it actually happened in Genesis 11. So what am I, why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you all this because when God appeared to Abraham, he was with his family, his father, his dad's name, Terah. Guess what Terah's name means? Delay. <laughs> God spoke to him there, told him, leave them, leave delay, leave all this, right? The Bible says that Terah went all the way to Haran and died there. It says that he dwelt there and built a camp there. He dwelt there. So this delay who Abram took with him, which he wasn't supposed to take with him, nor was he supposed to take Lot. He took all them with him. And his father said, we stop in here in Haran. Delay. He dies there in Haran. Are you with me? But then he... Abram goes on, but he takes Lot with him. Lot's name means veil. It's a whole bunch of truths and all that. But again, all these things happen. Let me just, let me just jump to the, to the meat of this whole situation here. Let me say this, that the devil will try to turn your times of delay into times of questioning God. And if he can't get you to question God, or if he starts there and you go, no, 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 no. I know that God loves me. I know that God is true to me. If you, if you, if you, if you go, no, 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 my God is for me and not against me. Here's what the next thing the devil do. If that doesn't work, then he'll try you to make you think that something is wrong with you. You did something wrong. That's why this happened. Yeah. 
All of that is a lie. Hit the person next to you and say, delay does not mean I've messed up. The devil would love to. He's an accuser. He wants to make first accuse God. God isn't doing what he said he's going to do. Now watch. Granted, there are some things we're not going to understand completely and totally. We're righteous. We've been standing on the word. It didn't happen the way. It didn't work out the way we wanted to. But I'm telling you, all that will be overshadowed. We'll understand all of it when we get to heaven. Come on. Don't put all your, don't put all your eggs in one basket of earth. The Bible says that Abram, he had this eternal, Abraham had this eternal perspective. And although he was the wealthiest man on the earth in his time, never built a house. He stayed living in tents. Why? Because he knew this is not where I'm staying. It's all in Hebrews chapter 11. He he explains all this. Are y'all with me? (laughs) Now watch this. Think about it. We don't see it written in the lines here, but you know if you've ever been in a wait that you know this occurred. Here it goes. God tells Abraham, you're going to be a father of many nations. Years go by. First a month goes by. He's wondering what's going on. He's looking at all the pregnant women around him. He's seeing Gentiles. He's seeing God's going to build a new nation with him and he has no kids. God is starting a whole nation of people with this man and his wife and they have no children and they start out and they're 75 years old. God took an impossible situation and said, I'm going to do something great through you. It doesn't look like it though. Now think about it. If they're human beings just like us, you know that Sarah the whole time is nagging him. What is this? What are you talking, what is this God of yours talking? He appeared to you, how? What is this, what are you saying? How come everybody else is having kids but me? How come everybody else, here, come on, I'm telling you this. How come everybody else is getting blessed but me? How come I see sinners who don't even know you, know Jesus, how come they're getting blessed and I'm not? How come I come to that church and I get up and I, and I serve the Lord and I do this, Lord, and you talk, I talk to you, I've got a genuine relationship, why isn't this happening for me? Come on, are y'all listening to me in this place? You know Abraham and Sarah had many nights up all night (laughs) talking about what is going on here. We went down to Egypt and there's all these pregnant. They're walking all around and I'm sitting here talking about, Lord, the Lord appeared to you, please. Are y'all listening to me? And this is real, but God wanted them to get a revelation of something. God wanted them to get a revelation that you, that I'm on board and I'm right. I'm, you're righteous because you simply believe in me. And I'm here to tell you, he got a revelation of this. He finally got a revelation and it's all explained in Romans that he eventually got to the point. Now watch, there were many times he didn't believe. They pretty much, Sarah said, look here, it's apparent that God don't want me to have kids. It's apparent that it's not going to come through me. Come on, she talked him into this it's, and then fussed at him after he has a baby with another woman that she told him to go have a, ba- a baby with. Yeah. Come on, y'all. I'm telling you, there was some drama in this household that the Bible doesn't show us all that's been going down. But come on, just imagine. Just imagine. What is this God talking about? Where is this? Is there, are, is there anybody in here who knows what I'm talking about? <laughs> But what is God wanting them to get? He's wanting them to get a revelation. Now, let me just jump to the short of this story because my time's already almost out and I got about four of the stories I want to share with you. I'm not going to be able to share all of it with you. But watch this. Jump over to Genesis chapter 20 because now Sarah's 90, Abram's 100 years old, and 24 years has passed by. 24 years. Let me just say this. Here's what God's promise is. I'm giving you, I'm going to give you seed and I'm going to make that seed innumerable like the stars of the sky and the sand of the seashore. In fact, every one of us, the Bible calls us the seed of Abraham. So it worked. It worked. He got what he got the promise of God. It worked. You're the seed of Abraham. Are you with me? Come on, somebody. So it worked. Something happened here. Something happened, and he got, he didn't just get one child that he was believing for. God wanted him to get nations. So in the wait, God wants to bring you more than what you're expecting. All right, so you, you got to know this. You're special. And it, we see this throughout every story in the Bible where there's a woman who's believing for a child. They, they get in their old age. Now, here's, here's something that's real unique here. Let me just say, they end up having a, a very special child. The, the seed that comes in the weight is something more supernatural and greater than had you gotten it quickly and naturally. When God brings the past, the thing that you're believing for, it's going to be supernatural and better. All the single women that are believing God for husbands, don't 
run out and get one with your own, with your body. Oh, that's a Wednesday night topic again, <laughs> but don't do it. If you'll, if you'll allow God to do it, you'll get something so much better. You say, but pastor, I'm getting so old. That's what you think about Sarah and Abraham. But guess what God did? God made their youth so renewed in the weight that age, at age 90, a king whose title is, is, is uh, um, what's his title? The, 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 the Abimelech, the Abimelech, the Abimelech, that's what he's called, an Abimelech. He's like a king. He is, she, Sarah is so fine at age 90 that he has 18, 19, 20-year-old women in his harem, but he now sees this 90-year-old woman and says, I've got to have her. Why? Because in the wait, God is going to restore to you everything that was lost, everything that was missing. He gave them back their youth that she was so fine at age 90. You're not going to miss out on anything in the way. You've just got to talk in line with the word of God. God restored their youth because that's what was something that would have been lost had they waited naturally. But they waited in faith and God restored their youth. Everything got restored. Are y'all listening to me in this place? In the way, God assures us that you get everything that's lost sevenfold. Oh my God. Turn to Hebrews 6, verse 11 through 15. And I'm closing because my time's already up. Are you with me? Oh, God, there's so... All right. Uh, Hebrews, 11, verse, uh, Hebrews 6, verse 11. Watch this. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. It's talking about Abraham in this chapter. Watch. That you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Yes. Through faith and and patience. Say faith and patience. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. God put his own self on the line with the promise. Oh, y'all. Saying, surely blessing, I will bless you and multiplying, I will multiply you. Next. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Close your Bible because I'm out of time. Listen to me, friend. Every promise that God makes you. Now, this is why it's so important that you know the promises of God. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And for everything that God has, there's a written promise in the in the scriptures, in Psalms and Proverbs. Again, I taught this in great detail on Wednesday. But in the Psalms and Proverbs, there is a detailed promise about everything you could possibly be believing for. That, and it says the righteous. It says something like this. Uh, the seed of the righteous will be delivered. It'll say the house of the righteous is filled with great and priceless treasure. It says that righteousness delivers from death. It says, so there's a promise for every detail. But the Bible lets us know that righteousness speaks. And that we've got to know that we're the righteousness of God. And then put it in our mouth and begin to declare it. Declare it. So we patiently endure by declaring and stating that we are the chief people of God. We are the righteousness of God. And we encourage ourselves through the scriptures by knowing God absolutely cannot lie. And for everything I lose, if I lose anything, I'm going to have it restored sevenfold here in the earth. I am telling you, you cannot lose as a child of God. Hit that person next to you and say, be encouraged. You can't lose as a child of God. Y'all receive that today. I can't go any further. <laughs> 